Bookstore and Central Books. Our lecturer for today is a distinguished academian, author, bar reviewer, and law practitioner. He graduated magna cum laude and class valedictorian of the University of Santo Tomas Faculty of Civil Law, where he is also currently serving as the dean. He holds a doctorate degree in humanities honoris causa at the Instituto Educado para a Paz in Brazil. He is also a professor of law at the UP College of Law, teaching commercial law review, a bar reviewer at the UST and Magnificus Review Center, Law Review Center, UP Law Center, Legal Edge, and other review centers. He also authored different law books, all of which primarily focused on commercial law. Aside from his academic endeavors, our lecturer is also the founder and managing partner of Divina Law. His firm earned both local and global recognition as one of the top commercial firms in litigation as one of the top law firms in commercial litigation. He is also he also served as a regular columnist at the Philippine Daily Tribune and as the chairman and president of the Philippine Association of Law Schools. Please welcome our lecturer for our commercial law review, Dean Milo Devina. Dean, good thank afternoon. You. Thank you so much, Pat. Uh, thank you, Pat. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Pat. Good afternoon, everyone. So, shall I proceed or start, Pat? Okay, so I always start my lecture with a prayer that I composed for all barristers, I think about uh, 10 years ago. Can you kindly flash on the screen uh, the barrister's prayer, uh, Sarah? Very good. So dear God, source of all my being and countless blessings through you and in you and with you, all things are possible beyond my imagining. As I embark on this journey, who hurdled the bar and approximate my goal towards becoming a lawyer. I humbly beg you to send me your divine spirit to help me answer the questions aided by your wisdom, grace and articulation to present my thoughts clearly and accurately, memory to help recall things I have learned and yet to learn, faith securing the truth that you are with me all the days of my life, hope for you're the anchor of all I am and hope to be. Rectitude of intention that I may discern and glorify your will. <clears throat> I pray, Lord, that you grant my desire to exalt and praise you to the results of my bar exams. Help me to do my best and override my preparations with your grace. Calm me, strengthen me, and embrace me dearly because though with limitations, I offer this bar as a way to seek your kingdom. For as it is written, Seek you first the kingdom of God, and everything will be added unto you. Teach me to persevere, to work diligently, to pray unceasingly, and to rest on your promises, and to have all on your unfailing love. In the mighty name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and to the intercession of our mother, Mary, St. Damon of Peña Ford, I pray, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day of daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. It is not in the temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. It was the beginning, it's done, it shall be, or without an amen. Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. All right, so let's start our lecture. So this is basically a lecture on the recent cases decided by the Supreme Court. By recent, I mean the last four years up to June 30, 2022, the cut-off date for your bar examinations. Of course, included likewise in our lecture are the ponencias of Justice uh, Ramon Hernando on commercial law. So let's start with banking and special commercial laws. Uh, this case of Macam versus Allied Bank, this is a case penned, by the way, by Justice uh, Mon, Mon Hernando. We all know that uh, banks are required to exercise extraordinary diligence when it comes to performance of the duties, when it comes to handling funds. Now, 
owned by their clients. Unlike common carrier, where it is found in the law itself, in the obligation to exercise extra ordinary diligence is found in the law itself. There is nothing in the law that says that banks are required to exercise extraordinary diligence, right? And yet, time and again, the Supreme Court keeps on ruling consistently that is that banks are required to exercise extraordinary diligence when it comes to handling of funds. Why is that so? And where is, uh, what is the basis of that uh, Supreme Court pronouncement repeated over and over again? It is found in the policy of the state towards banking, general banking law. That requires banks to exercise the highest degree or standard of integrity or care in the performance of the duties with respect to handling funds by the clients. So the question now is, will this obligation to exercise extraordinary diligence be enforced against the bank even though it's not written into the terms and conditions of the contract of deposit with the depositor? And Justice Monernado said, it is not important, it's not required, not necessary, that they be incorporated in the terms and conditions of the uh, agreement between the bank and its depositors. Because this obligation is implied, deemed read, into every contract of deposit between the bank and the depositors. Right? Now, one example of the breach of this duty is this case of Macomb versus Allied Bank. So, Allied Bank basically accepted deposit from his spouse's Macam about 1.5 million pesos. So, they accepted deposit, right? Allowed withdrawals from the account of uh, spouse Macam. So, by accepting the deposits from Macam and allowed withdrawals therefrom, the bank acknowledges that Macam owned the deposit and, of course, the account. So, therefore, it cannot debit the account unilaterally without the consent of spouse Macam, the depositor that is, just because of the assumption that they can be traced from false or fraudulent fund transfers. So the allegation of Allied Bank in this case that the money in the account of Macam originated or could be traced from false fund transfers cannot be the basis for the bank to debit the account of the client. Why is that so? Again, because the bank, having received the deposit, along with drawers therefrom, acknowledges that spouse Macam owns the deposit. So it cannot just debit the account on the assumption that these are not the monies of uh, spouse Macam. Debiting the account of spouse Macam without their consent is a breach of the bank's obligation to exercise extraordinary diligence. Next. Next. Right, let's move on to anti-money laundering law. Uh, this is a case uh, uh, penned by Justice uh, uh, Leon, but it's very important. And this pertains to the obligation of the bank to report covered and suspicious transactions. Uh, you all know that uh, uh, banks are required to report to the anti-money laundering council covered and suspicious transactions, right? Over transaction, uh, it is actually in excess of 500,000 pesos in one banking day. Suspicious transaction, we all know, is any transaction, regardless of amount, made under suspicious circumstances, right? Okay. So let's say uh, the bank or the covered institution reports to the AMLAC covered and suspicious transaction. Okay. Can the AMLAC be compelled to disclose the information contained in the report? Or is the AMLAC covered likewise by the rule on confidentiality? Okay. Now, you all know that covered transactions, business transactions, so far as the banks are concerned, are confidential. They are required to report only to the anti monitoring Council but cannot share the information with others, right? To do so, to breach the obligation of confidentiality is a violation of the anti money laundering law, right? But the Supreme Court said to Justice Leonin, the anti money laundering Council is not included in the prohibition. Therefore, the AMLAC can, can disclose, can provide to the court upon subpoena information about covert and suspicious transaction. So the AMLAC is not just a repository of information about covert and suspicious transaction. There's an obligation to enforce the law itself, to prosecute violators of the anti-mandating law. 
that obligation will be impaired, cannot be exercised, cannot be fulfilled if the AMLAC will be prevented from sharing or providing the court information about covered and species transactions reported by the bank or the covered institution. Okay. Now, what is the background or context of this case, Republic versus Liga Maya? Uh, Lionair sold, at least it was the allegation that Lionair sold second-hand helicopters uh, to uh, the Philippine National uh, Police. You're not supposed to sell, uh, obviously, second-hand, uh, uh, you know, uh, items to the PNB. You're supposed to sell brand new, right? So it was the allegation against Lion Air that um, what they sold to PNP are second-hand helicopters, and that the owners of the owner of the helicopters sold to PNP was the former first gentleman um, Arroyo, say Arroyo. And so to to prove the allegation that these are second-hand uh, uh, helicopters, then that um, uh, Arroyo, the first former first gentleman. Uh, allegedly owns these uh, helicopters. A check was issued by by uh, the former first gentleman payable to Lion Air. And that check was deposited in the account of Lion Air. So they want to get a copy of the check to prove that these are secondhand helicopters and uh, the helicopters owned previously by the former first gentleman. All right. So subpoena uh, was issued to, to the bank to produce this check. But the account had long been closed. And bank has a policy of retaining records only for a period of five years. In fact, under AMLA, the retention period, right, for co covered uh, transactions, space transactions, is only five years. But the account had long been closed, more than five years. So no more information can be disclosed uh, arising from that closed account. All right. So it was suggested that the information be obtained from the anti money laundering council. Because after all, the bank reported, right, this transaction to the anti money laundering council. Okay. So the uh, ombudsman uh, filed a motion with the Sending Bayan for issuance of subpoena addressed to the anti money laundering council to produce the check or information about the check. Objected to by the, uh, by the anti money laundering council because this is supposed to be confidential. So records about AMLA are confidential. So that's the context. So can AMLA be compelled to provide this information to the court? Upon subpoena, of course, by the court. And the answer is in the affirmative. So to repeat, the Supreme Court said, AMLA is not just a repository of information about covered and suspicious transactions. It is the obligation to enforce the law itself and the obligation to prosecute violators of the anti-money laundering law. And this obligation will, will be, cannot be carried out to the fullest if AMLAC is prevented from disclosing this information to the court. So AMLAC, to repeat, is not one of those trans one of not one of those institutions covered by the rule on confidentiality. Next. Okay, this is a very important uh, case on the distinction between a freeze order and a bank inquiry order. Okay, uh, and then of course, side together with this discussion is the period of a uh, freeze order. All right now, we all know a freeze order is only a preservative measure or remedy. What does it mean if the AMLAC applies for a freeze order with the CA? And the CA issues it because there's probable cause that the funds relate to unlawful activities under the anti money laundering law. So the freeze order basically prevents, right, the owner of the account from withdrawing from the funds. Uh, it prevents movement of the account while while during the 60, during the, the period of the freeze order to help the government build up a case for violation of the anti money laundering law, right? Preparatory to a civil forfeiture case to be filed with the RTC. Now, uh, this on this this case, uh, there was a discussion about the the length of time or the period of the freeze order. One thing is certain, obviously, it cannot be indefinite. It cannot be indefinite. Why? Because it's only preservative and preventive in nature, right? You cannot stop all throughout the proceedings or all throughout the case the deposit from withdrawing his money. Right? At a certain point, the freeze order should be 
rendered inefficacious. So that's why uh, this case led to the amendment to the anti laundering law. The total period, as you know, uh, of the uh, freeze order is six months. Right? Six months. So initially, if uh, the the CA is convinced there's a probable cause that the funds subject of the freeze order relate to lawful activity, it's an issue order within 20 days. Right? 20 days. Now, during the 20-day period, there'll be a hearing, a summary hearing to determine if the freeze order will be lifted or extended. If extended, it can be for a period of more than six months from issuance, right? Okay. So that amendment to the law is because of this case. All right. Now, what about the distinction between uh, the freeze order and um, and a bank in good order? Next slide, sir. What's the distinction? Okay. So I think it should be the next slide. Next uh, one more. There you go. This is a case penned again by Justice uh, Leonen. Um, a bank inquiry order enables or allows the anti money laundering council to inquire further into the deposit without violating the Republic Act 1405 of the law secrecy of bank deposit. So the same the same standard, of course, uh, the same obligation applies to AMLAC. It must establish there's probable cause that the funds subject of the bank inquiry or relate to unlawful activities under the anti laundering law. Once issued by the CA, then the AMLA can get more information from the from the cover institution. Well, usually, usually of course, the bank. Uh, get more information about the uh, the deposit itself. If indeed they relate or it relates to unlawful activity under the anti laundering law. A bank inquiry order is not tantamount to a freeze order, right? A bank inquiry order does not stop the withdrawal of the funds. A bank inquiry order does not prevent, basically, movement of the funds. So the depositor may still get his money, withdraw his money from the account despite the bank inquiry order. Okay. It is a freeze order that will stop withdrawal of the funds or prevent movement therefrom, right? Now, which one should come first? A bank inquiry order or a freeze order? So Justice Marvick Jordan said, it is based on the strategy of the anti money laundering council. So it may apply for a freeze order right, without a bank in good order, right? If it thinks it has sufficient evidence to, uh, to initiate prosecution for violation of the law. Or it can start with the bank in good order first if it thinks that the information is not enough unless uh, uh, more is gathered and obtained from the bank or the covered institution. As to which one comes first, it's a matter of strategy uh, to be determined by the anti-money laundering uh, council. Now, you all know, of course, that a bank inquiry order and a freeze order can now be issued ex parte. And like before, only a freeze order can be issued ex parte. A bank inquiry order could not be issued ex parte uh, because of the amendment to the law. Both bank inquiry order and freeze order can be granted ex parte. But they, they are not uh, the same. So the AMLAC wants both, then it has to apply for both orders with the CA. It, it, if it wants only a freeze order, it can do so, as, as I said, no, depending on the strategy of the anti money laundering also. Kindly back up. Previous slide. Okay, this one, this uh, this slide here. L let's, let's say that the you all know that it's not the CA, right, that will render judgment to forfeit the funds. The CA will issue the freeze order or the bank inquiry order. You all know that um, within within uh, six months is the effectivity of the freeze order. The total period is six months. Now, if the period ex expires, then the fund subject of the freeze order can be withdrawn, right? Automatically, it's lifted after six months. Unless, in the meantime, the AMLAC is able to file a petition for forfeiture, right, with the RTC and ask and obtain an asset preservation order. All right. Now, what happens if the RTC issues a preserve asset preservation order? So, it's same effect as a freeze order. No movement shall be allowed from the funds or account from the deposit of the, um, of the account holder subject of the case. Now, what if, let's say, they're not able to establish that those funds relate to a local activity? 
the owner, of course, may ask for the release, right, of the funds. Okay. Now, this is the ruling um, on the second slide. Should there be a separate order, let's say a petition is filed to release the funds? And the petition is sufficient in form and substance. All right. Is there a need for the RTC to issue a separate order that a petition to response is sufficient form and substance before AMLA can comment there too? Or is it enough that when the court requires the AMLA to comment, the comment must be filed, otherwise the right of AMLA to file is waived. So just uh, the Supreme Court said that there is no uh, requirement for the RTC to issue a separate order that the petition to list funds is sufficient form of substance before AMLA will file a comment. So once AMLA is required by the court to file comment, to the petition to response, then comment should be filed, right? With the period required by the court. If not is filed, nothing is filed, then the court may now release the uh, the the forfeited funds. Next. 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 Okay, let's move on to corporation law. The case of Bisnar Sisters of Our Lady of uh, Fatima. Uh, regarding classes of cooperation, this has not been asked in the bar whether civil law or commercial law. Uh, well, first, in relation to this discussion on classes of cooperation, you have the URE and de facto cooperation. What is a de facto cooperation? It's a cooperation that exists in fact, but not in law, as you know. Uh, it's a cooperation that is allowed to exist despite infirmity in the formation of the cooperation, right? So the state allows it to exist despite infirmity in its formation. And until the state questions its existence in a, in a co warranty proceeding, it can exercise all the powers of a cooperation, right? Now, what are the elements of de facto cooperation? Okay, you have, of course, a valid law under which it is organized. Second, bona the attempt to incorporate and third act for exercise of corporate powers, right? Okay. The second element is the core uh, element involved in this case. Bona fide attempt to incorporate. So what do you mean by bona fide attempt to incorporate? It means at the very least, certificate of incorporation issued by the SEC. So there can be no de facto cooperation with a certificate of incorporation issued by the SEC. So if the articles of the cooperation is filed with the SEC, at that point, is there a de facto cooperation? Not yet, right? Not yet. None. None. Until the SEC issues certificate of um, incorporation. So what marks the existence of de facto cooperation is the issuance by the SEC of certificate of incorporation. Now, what happened in this case? What is the context? So, uh, a certain purification, uh, a zona, donated a piece of property to the mother superior of Mr. and Sisters of Our Lady of Fatima. She was taken care of by the uh, mother superior of the uh, religious society. But at the time the donation was made, the religious society was not organized yet as a religious corporation. So there was a suggestion to organize it into religious cooperation, right? But when donation was made, so the articles of the cooperation has not been filed with the SEC, right? So donation was done without the SEC issuing yet certificate of incorporation. Okay. First question is the missionary sisters of Radio Fatima a de facto cooperation? To make the donation valid because as you know meaning uh the the donor has to have a legal personality right to accept the donation uh the only possible exception that the donor may not have legal personality is if you make a donation to a fetus in the mother's womb so the donation is valid subject to of course the uh the the fetus in the mother's womb acquiring legal personality I mean, subject to giving birth basically all right so that's the only exception, but but you cannot be a donor unless you have the legal 
personality to accept. Okay. So is that a de facto cooperation? What is the answer? No, it's not de facto, right? Why is it not de facto? Because there is a certificate of incorporation yet issued by the SEC. But is the nation valid? The nation is valid despite the fact that there was no de facto cooperation. Why? Because the DONI was a cooperation by Estoppel. Okay? Not de facto, but cooperation by Estoppel. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm sure in, in your, in our review, in our previous review on, uh, well, in your, in your uh, study of cooperation you know, during the fourth year or the, the regular review, that is, uh, the, the general concept of cooperation by Estoppel is that the um, ostensible cooperation is not allowed to invoke its lack of legal personality, right? For any obligation it incurred or tort it committed, right? So it is basically, uh, the doctrine is usually applied against the one who claims to be a cooperation when in fact it's not legally authorized to do so. That ostensible cooperation cannot say, we're not a cooperation, right? So that de defense is not available for any obligation committed or tort it is it liable to or liable for. But there's another side the doctrine of cooperation by Stoppel. The flip side of the doctrine of cooperation by Stoppel applied in this case. What is that? He who assumes an obligation from or to an extensible cooperation, knowing it has no legal personality, cannot resist performance, right? On the ground that, in fact, there is no uh, cooperation filed or registered with the SEC. So the donor was aware that the DONI was not a corporation, right? It's only in society. She knew it, but she incurred an obligation to it. Therefore, can resist performance of that obligation on the ground that in fact there was no cooperation. So that made the nation valid because the DONI, while not a de facto cooperation, is a cooperation by Stoka. Next. Okay, this is a case by Justice Mon Hernando. Uh, BCDA. So BCDA, uh, Basis Conversion Development Authority. Uh, let's say, as you know, uh, it's it's a um, uh, government instrumentality, right, that uh, uh, organized to uh, put into productive use, conserve, preserve, or put into productive use military reservations. They sold... Uh, the fourth uh, the property in Taguig, right? To the Ayalas and the Seas. So they were charged tax for selling the property. They filed a petition for refund. And uh, they're being assessed payment of filing fee. Is BCDA subject to payment of filing fee? The defense of BCDA, we're not, we're not liable to pay a filing fee because we're not a corporation where the government is eventually performing corporate power. So is BCDA a corporation? Is it a stock or non-stock corporation? It's not a stock corporation, right? Why not a stock corporation? Because it lacks the characteristics or basic features of a stock corporation. What are those two features? Number one, it is a company stock divided into shares. Second, authorized to distribute profits to the stockholders or the holders of the shares based on the well, based on the shares held by them. So the capital of BCDA, 100 billion, is not divided into shares. On that score alone, it's not a stock operation. Second, no profits are distributed right to stockholders. Everything is limited to national treasury. Is it a non-stock operation? Not non-stock. Why? It's not organized for any of the purposes allowed for non-stock operation. If you take a Section 88, right? So charitable, religious, fraternal, uh, civic, and then educational, literary, it does not include the purpose for which BCD was organized, and that is to own, hold, and administer Military reservation, the kind of implements conversion to other productive use. So it's not one of the purposes for non-stock operation. 
So it's neither stock nor non-stock. What is it then? It's a mere government instrumentality performing corporate powers. What has corporate powers? Therefore, not subject to payment of filing fee. Another potential question is, is BCDA a, a GOCC, a government owning control government? The answer is, of course, no. Why? Because one of the first, the first element of a GOCC is organized, right? Or created by special charter or organized under a general law on incorporation. Meaning, either it has a charter of its own or it must be a stock or non stock operation, right? So, BCDA has no separate charter. And then it is not stock or non stock operation. So, therefore, Therefore, BCDA is not a GOCC. So not GOCC, not stock, nor non-stock corporation. Yes. Okay, another case penned by Justice uh, uh, Mon Hernando. Linden Switch versus Meridian uh, Far East Properties. So there was a judgment against uh, Meridian Far East Properties so it's property encroach into the property of Linden Switch. So Linden Switch asked Meridian Far East Properties to uh, demolish it. And it was demolished, all right, by Meridian Far East Properties, but the demolition work was not completed. So Linden Switch was forced to complete the, the uh, removal of the uh, property and incurred costs in the process. So it wanted to get reimbursement from Meridian Far East Properties for the cost of removing uh, the, that, that wall that adjoined or encroached on the property of, of Linden Switch. Meridian Forest Properties refused. So Linden Switch filed a case for collection damages, won. And uh, it became final executory. Now, as they were trying to enforce the judgment, they could not find the address of uh, the defendant, transferred so and so, it is placed from one place to another, and they could not find any leverable property, right? So what did they do? Linden Switch filed a motion to examine the directors and officers of Meridian Far East Properties. Okay? Motion to examine judgment of Ligor, basically. So uh, subpoena issued by the court to compel them to testify right, on the properties of Meridian Far East Property. So the Council of Religion Forest Properties claimed that this violates the doctrine of separate legal personality. So the directors and officers cannot be forced to testify because it's not them liable, but the corporation. Okay. So the question in this case is, does the doctrine of separate legal personality apply? It does not apply, right? Because the directors and officers were not being made liable for the obligation of the corporation. They're being asked to testify on the properties of the corporation that can be subject of the execution, right? So it's an incident to the execution process. Would have been different if they're being made liable for the obligation of the corporation, but they're not. They're just being asked to testify on where are the properties that belong to the uh, defendants, corporation, now judgment that in the case. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry. Let's take a Cymex. Well, Cymex is 2017, so we, we should not include that. It's more than uh, more than four years. That's next. Okay, Mar Maricalu Mining versus Torrentino. This is a case run by the Chief Justice. Uh, okay. So a, a potential question in this case the difference between a holding company and a parent company, right? Okay. When you say, is it possible for a parent company to have more than one subsidiaries? Yes, obviously, right? So Banco de Oro has many subsidiaries. One subsidiary for, uh, for um, as an investment house, one subsidiary for uh, uh, property, so forth and so on. What about the holding company? A holding company has many subsidiaries. What's the difference? The difference is this. A holding company is organized to invest in equity. 
of other companies, but it's not operating. So the only operation of the of the holding companies to invest in the equity to be a stockholder of different uh, corporations, right? Under an umbrella-like structure, so that all of the subsidiaries will have the same policies. Now, parent company, right, has its own operation, not just to invest in equity. So, Banco de Oro is engaged in banking. It's a parent company of many subsidiaries. BDO cannot be holding company because it's performing as a bank. What is an example of a holding company? Well, SMIC, SM Investment Company, the investment arm uh, of the C family. This organized to invest in equity. It owns Banco de Oro. It owns SM Schumart. It owns uh, SM Leisure. It owns SM Hypermart. Okay. Now, whether holding company or a parent company, they're not liable, right, for the obligations incurred by the subsidiaries. So let's say an employee of one of the subsidiaries is not paid, has a claim against subsidiary. Can that claim be enforced against the parent company, the holding company? The answer is no, right? Because uh, the fact that the parent company or the holding company owns nearly all or all of the company's stock of subsidiary, not enough to disregard its separate existence. So the claim of the employee can only be enforced against subsidiary, but not against the parent company or the holding company. Okay. So there are three, remember, there are three conditions before the parent company or the holding company can be made liable for the claim of a creditor of the subsidiary. What are these? First, control. Control not only in shareholdings, but also in finances and business practices such that the subsidiaries have no mind of their own with respect to the transaction attacked. So the parent company, holding company, may own shares, may have control over shares, right? Otherwise, it's not a parent company, holding company. But it has to have control also in finances and business practices, such that the subsidiary had no more mind of its own with respect to the subject of the transaction. And second, even though there is control in these three aspects, the control must be used to perpetuate fraud, to violate a duty in contravention of the plaintiff's right. And third, the control and breach of duty, the proximate cause of the harm suffered by a third party. So the so-called elements of the alter ego test, without which elements the parent or subsidiary, or the parent or the holding company rather, can be made liable for the obligations of the subsidiary. Okay. Now, uh, I, the reason why I mentioned that, okay, I, I explained a bit or quite, a, I mean, not a bit, I explained uh meaning um uh, quite extensively the elements of the alter ego test because of a case penned by justice leon uh, justice of sorry, hernando this one the next slide can you take a look at the the next uh, slide the next slide please next slide sarah oops there you go. The, no, not, not, not this one. I think, there you go. Uh, Gesol Gon versus Cyber, Cyber 1 PH. Okay, kindly backtrack now. Uh, what, what's the background of this case? So, Cyber 1 Australia, uh, kindly backtrack, sorry. Cyber 1 Australia is a foreign corporation mm, hired, you uh, know, uh, call, call center uh, agents or employees, no? call center employees. So eventually, these call center employees were promoted uh, to become supervisors. And because the performance was, was excellent, they were made to be incorporators and directors of Cyber One Philippines. Okay? So Cyber One Australia hired them. Okay, they're promoted by Cyber One Australia. Eventually, they were made directors and cooperators of Cyber One Philippines. Okay, unfortunately, of course, after quite some time, so good, no one customer, yung uh, Cyber One Australia, so no one mga trabaho or ta uh, tasks. So they asked these employees or these officers, or they gave them several options. They go back 
or square one balik sa balik sa entry level mag magresign or indefinite for law until magkaroon ng trabaho okay so pinili nila for law muna but then eventually they were asked to go they resign okay they file a case against Cyber One Philippines okay not not Cyber One uh, uh, Australia no okay because Cyber Australia is in, in is in is in Australia not subject to the court's jurisdiction, right? So they file a case in Cyber One Philippines. Okay, that's the background. Let's take a look at the possible questions. First question on foreign cooperation, right? Foreign cooperation. Um, is Cyber One Australia doing business in the Philippines just because it has a subsidiary? Cyber One Philippines. The answer is no. Because Cyber One Philippines has a legal personality separate and distinct from Cyber One Australia. It would have been different if Cyber One uh, Australia only has a branch or rep office, right? Or operating headquarters in the Philippines. But this one, the structure is that Cyber One Philippines is a corporation. Subsidiary with separate legal personality from the foreign operation. Right. Now, next uh, potential question. So, were these employees hired by Cyber One Australia have a case against Cyber One Philippines just because it is a subsidiary of Cyber One Australia? And Justice Hernandez said, no. Okay, no. And he reiterated the three areas by which you can pierce the veil of government fiction, by which you can consider Cyber One Australia and Philippines one the same entity. What are the areas where you can pierce the veil of government fiction? You remember to refresh the memory. The first, uh, well, the, if the notion of separate legal personality is used to defeat public convenience, right? If the notion of fiction is used to um, avoid a policy of the state. Second. If the notion of fiction of separate legal personality is used to perpetuate fraud. And third, the alter ego test that requires those two elements we mentioned a while ago. And Justice Bonanano said, all of this do not apply in this case. So no, no public convenience, no policy ever violated. It was not used to perpetuate fraud and the three elements of alter ego test likewise not present. Remember, they were directors, right? They were directors of Cyber One Philippines. Directors, incorporators, right? So they have no case against Cyber One Philippines because they're not employees of Cyber One Philippines. They're employees of, of, uh, of uh, Cyber One Australia. They should have filed a case against Cyber One Australia, not Cyber One Philippines, right? Okay. Next potential question. Can you pierce the veil of corporate fiction of Cyber One um, Australia to make it one and the same Cyber One Philippines, assuming that any of those areas, any of those grounds, uh, DVD public convenience, fraud, and ad ego is present. And the Supreme Court said, no. Why? Because Cyber One Australia was not brought to the court's jurisdiction. You cannot pierce the bare common fiction of a corporation over which the corporation did not acquire uh, jurisdiction. How do you acquire jurisdiction over uh, the corporation whose corporate value intent appears? By service of summons, right? And unrecognized modes of acquiring jurisdiction involving a cause of action that is fully litigated. Where that corporation, of course, brought to the court's jurisdiction. So the respondent, the respondents do not include Cyber One Australia. Therefore, even assuming this ground success, you can pierce the bare common fiction of Cyber One Australia to make it one the same Cyber One Philippines. Okay, next. Okay, uh, this Salid Salido verse are my one metals on uh, treasury shares. Uh, in fact, there are many principles we can learn from this case. Um, anyway, uh, what what is the what is the background or context of this case? Let's say Wonder Cruise 
subscribes to um, 100,000 shares of stock of ABC Corporation. He paid 25,000 out of the 100,000 uh, peso subscription. Of course, in the actual case, more. No? But I'm just trying to simplify the facts. Because uh, allegedly, he could not, he did not pay the balance of the subscription. The corporation ordered the reduction of his subscription from 100,000 to 25,000. Correspond to the amount he actually paid. Right? And then declared that the 75,000 unpaid shares become or became treasury shares. Right? So that's the background. 100,000 subscription, ang binyaran lang, 25%. Hindi na binyaran yung 75,000. The corporation said, All right, uh, let's reduce the uh, subscription from 100,000 to 25,000 only, responding to the amount he paid. And then for the unpaid subscription, declared them as treasury shares. All right. So what, first question, is it valid? I mean, uh, the, the resolution on the board to order proposed the direct reduction of subscription, is that valid? It's not valid, right? Why? So why? And here, there are many reasons we can cite. You can cite in case it gets to be asked in the bar. The first reason, it violates the trust fund doctrine, right? The subscriptions, the entire subscriptions, the entire 100,000 pesos for the 100,000 subscription, funds held in trust for the benefit of the creditors. Okay, Creditors have the right to look up to these subscriptions as source of payment for their claim against the corporation. So the uh, unpaid subscription cannot be condoned, right? Otherwise, it will prejudice the interest of creditors. Second, all right, second principle violated, the doctrine of individuality or divisibility of subscription, right? The entire hand subscription is one and indivisible. Hindi pwede ipismil-pismil base yan, right? Why, why, why is it one and indivisible? So in case of default, the corporation can sell as many shares as possible to pay the unpaid subscription. Okay, third. Third law violated. If the shares are delinquent, what is the remedy? The remedy is not to declare them to the shares, right? What's the remedy? Identify an action for collection or cause the sale of delinquent shares, right? Declare them delinquent and then uh, uh, order by, by resolution the sale of the delinquent shares, right? And apply the proceeds against the uh, unpaid subscription. Now, if there is no bidder, appropriate the shares in payment of the unpaid subscription as long as the corporation has surplus profit, right? Okay. Next. All right. Is it proper to declare the unpaid subscription as treasury shares? The ruling in this case. No? And the Supreme Court said no. Why? What are treasury shares? Treasury shares are actually issued by the corporation, issued, fully paid out standing, right? And be acquired by the corporation to purchase, redemption, donation, other lawful means. So they were never acquired by the corporation to any of those modes, right? Purchase, redemption, uh, donation, other local means. So they can be considered as treasury shares. And then before you can acquire them as treasury shares, you have to have service profit. Not It was not established in this case that the corporation has service profit to be able to acquire uh, those shares as treasury. Next. Corporate officers, another case by Justice Mon Hernando. See, before the rules of civil procedure, the new rules came into effect. You remember, there were a series of Supreme Court decisions. Uh, well, certain officers can can sign initiatory pleading, like complaint or petition, or sign verification against non foreign shopping despite lack of board resolution. Generally, only the person authorized by the board, right, can sign initiatory pleading or verify against non forum shopping. A um, a pleading signed by a person not authorized by the board is a scrap of paper, right? But there are exceptions. What are the exceptions? The chairman, the president, general manager, human resource officer, and employment specialist in labor case. 
So any of these five can sign pleadings, verify against non forum shopping despite lack of border solution. All right. What is the reason? The reason is that uh, they're familiar with the affairs of the corporation and therefore they can certify as to the accuracy and the truthfulness of the allegations in the complaint or petition. And then the rules of procedure came about. The new rules require that the authority of the uh, one signed the pleading be appended to the petition or complaint. Right? So somehow, it gives the impression that those rulings no longer valid. Because you have to append, right? Authority of the person assigned to the complaint or petition itself. So therefore, you need a border solution, right? But despite the rules of civil procedure, the new rules of civil procedure, that's modern in this case of... Um, George Netic Swine Improvement versus Steen uh, Agri Product ruled that the chairperson and president may sign verification and certification against forum shopping or non forum shopping without need of a board solution. So the complaint petition cannot be dismissed just because there is no authority appended to the complaint petition if signed by the president or chairperson. Again, why? Because Chairman or President deemed to be familiar with the affairs of the cooperation and can certify as the accuracy or truthfulness of the allegation, the complaint, or petition. And the lack of authority can be cured by the subsequent uh, submission of a board resolution. Next. Okay, BDO Unibank versus Choa. Uh, TR is not part of the bar. Receipts law, not part of the bar. But this can be but potentially as in relation to uh, obligations or the duty of corporate directors and officers and the six cases they can be made liable with the corporation. Uh, to put it in the proper context, we know that as general rule, directors and officers and other agents are not liable for obligation incurred on behalf of the corporation, right? So corporate agents or representatives are not, not, not liable for obligations incurred on behalf of the corporation. So corporations are mere juridical beings. Persons cannot act without agents. And those agents, of course, not liable personally for any action taken on behalf of the corporation. Is the corporation liable, not the corporate agents or representatives? But there are exceptions, right? One of the exceptions is, the one relevant to our discussion, if express provision of law, they're made to answer for corporate obligation. And if the director, officer, agent make themselves or made themselves liable with the corporation, I mean, if they incur or assume the personal obligation themselves. Let's take a look at this case. In a TR transaction, as you know, there are two obligations imposed by law upon the entrustee, the importer entrustee. What are those? To uh, deliver the proceeds of the sale of the goods on the TR or to return the goods in case of non-sale, right? If these obligations are not fulfilled, then the person who signed a tier agreement may be held liable criminally. Criminally. Under Section 13 of PD 115, if the offender is a corporation, criminal liability is imposed upon the director or officer or a person responsible for the violation. And in the case of uh, Secretary of Justice versus Ching, you remember asking the bar, the director, officer, or agent to sign a tier agreement cannot invoke lack of legal cannot invoke the doctrine of separate legal personality. Uh, they cannot say they were not the ones who received the goods. Uh, they did not get the loan from the bank and the loan went to the entrusty uh, corporation. Those defenses are not availing because the law makes them liable for the act of the corporation. Right? Section 13 of PD-105, as I mentioned. Okay, But are they liable civilly? Are they liable civilly? They're not liable civilly. Why? Because uh, the one liable civilly is the corporation that obtained the loan, the corporation that obtained the goods and the TR. Unless that director, that officer, or that agent signs a separate shared agreement, a guarantee agreement, making themselves liable with the corporation. So to make them liable civilly, okay, they're liable criminally, right? But to make them liable civilly, they must sign a separate agreement to assume personal obligation, none of which obtained in this case. Are, if they sign a short agreement, are they liable solidarily? Yes, of course. If they sign a guarantee agreement, are they liable solidarily? No, they're liable subsidiarily. 
unless there is waiver of excursion. But just the same, they can be made liable civilly unless they have a separate agreement by which they assume personal obligation. Okay. Let's just take a... Uh, okay, let's, let's take a break after, uh, after 10, 15 minutes. After 15 minutes. Okay, 15 minutes. Metroplex versus uh, uh, Cinefield Corporation. It's a case penned by Justice Hernando again uh, on business judgment rule. So to, to simplify the facts, ABC and XYZ corporations entered into a swap agreement, swap uh, of shares. So by which ABC will become a stockholder of Cinefield Corporation. And XYZ will become a stockholder in a hotel Legend, Legend Resort in Mandaluyong owned by ABC Corporation. Okay. Ilang swap nila. Parang tayo shares. I'll make a stockholder of, uh, of XYZ Cinefield in our example and XYZ naman will make ABC stockholder of a uh, owner of stockholder of a, um, a hotel um, or owner of part owner of a hotel owned by ABC Corporation. Okay. So for whatever reason they decided to unwind the, unwind the swap agreement. Hindi na kasi no, unwind natin. Balik na, balikan. So, si uh, ABC ni return yung Cinefield shares. All right. Ang problema, Cinefield did not return the shares of the hotel. So, what ABC did, it reduced the capital stock. Okay. Corresponding to the amount of the shares not returned by XYZ Corporation. Yeah. Inangyari. Okay. The reduction of capital stock authorized by the board, approved by the board, the majority vote approved by stockholders representing these two thirds of the standing capital stock, okay, and approved by the SEC. All right. Now, after approval by the uh, SEC, the um, the department in charge for approving reduction of capital stock, the um, uh, CMRD, no, uh, Capital Registration Monitoring Department. So, file a petition for review with the SEC and bank to nullify the approval. On what ground? on the ground that the consent of all stockholders was not obtained. Second, the SEC must first resolve the contract disputes among the parties arising from the swap agreement and unwinding agreement. Right. Okay, let's take the question, the arguments one by one. Okay, there are two, right? Number one, is the approval of the stockholders, but the third agreement, the third argument is creditors approval not obtained. On the first argument, all the stockholders did not approve the reduction of capital stock. Is that a valid ground not to approve reduction of capital stock? Not valid, right? Why? The law does not require approval of all stockholders, right? What is required? Only two thirds of the standing capital stock, which was obtained in this case. Second, okay, second, should the SEC first resolve the contract of disputes uh, among the parties to the swap and unwinding agreement before it can approve the reduction of capital stock? And the Supreme Court said to Justice Juan Hernando, no, it will buy the business judgment rule. Once all of the requirements have been complied with, board approval, majority, Two-thirds, right, of stockholder uh, signing up for the stock. The amendment filed with the SEC. It becomes the arbitrary duty on the part of the SEC to approve the reduction of capital stock. So it becomes a pure administrative duty to approve the reduction of capital stock. To do otherwise is to interfere with the board on running the affairs of the corporation. To do otherwise is to violate the business judgment rule. Third, what about creditors consent? Is the consent of creditors required to approve reduction of capital stock? No, right? The requirement under the code then and now is the reduction should not prejudice, should not prejudice third party, third parties, including creditors. Should not prejudice. Not the consent, right? Not the consent. So as long as they are protected, as long as 
meaning there are enough assets to cover for the claim, then uh, the reduction of carbon stock, of course, may be approved by the cooperator, by, by the SEC. Okay, next. Okay, Inano Bote versus uh, Alvarez. Okay, on trust fund doctrine. We all know what trust fund doctrine is, as we mentioned a while ago. So uh, subscriptions, recovery stock, uh, are sponsoring trust for the for the creditors. They can be uh, dispersed, uh, impaired, no? Less the creditors be prejudiced. And the properties of the corporation like, are, are held for the benefit of the uh, creditors. So what do you mean by the by the um, subscriptions, the aggregate subscriptions, right? Not just the par uh, value, but the entire subscription received by the corporation for subscription of shares are funds held in trust for the benefit of creditors. So if the par value is 10 and the shares issued for 20, so what will be part of the uh, trust fund doc, the 10 peso par value subscription or the 20 peso subscription received by the corporation? Well, the SEC said, the entire, right? The entire subscriptions, not just a part value, but the entire subscriptions are funds in trust for the benefit of the creditors. What about properties? Uh, when when are they part of the uh, trust fund document? I mean, they cannot be returned to the stockholders, right? Except in case of dissolution and liquidation, reduction of stock, redemption of renewable shares. Now, let's take a look at this case. Can the creditor enforce payment of the unpaid subscription? We all know the answer is in the affirmative. That's what trust fund doc is all about, right? The subscriptions are funds held in trust for the benefit of the creditors. The other creditors may enforce payment of the same, right? But when may they do so? Okay, is it enough that they pay subscriptions or is it enough that subscriptions are not paid? Supreme Court said no. So, in addition to the subscription not being paid, the complaint filed by the creditor should plead or allege that the corporation has condoned unpaid subscription, has been dissolved, or is insolvent. So, any of these three, it has condoned unpaid subscription, it has it is undergoing dissolution, and there is insolvent. So unless this uh, is alleged, any of this is alleged in the complaint, then there is no basis to allow the creditor to file the action to enforce payment of the pay subscription because the, um, um, the obligation of the uh, subscriber no? uh, to, the, uh, to the creditor okay, dependent on any of those uh, allegations. What ha what's the context of this case? So, uh, Air Philippines entered to this agreement with Subic Bay, or City Hill Air, Air Philippines, no? uh, entered to this agreement with Subic Bay Metropolitan Authority to lease property owned by SBMA. Rentals were not paid, simple as that. Rentals were not paid, okay? So SBMA filed an action for collection of unpaid rentals against the lessee, right? And the unpaid subscribers of the lessee corporation. Okay, is that tenable? The answer is, it's not tenable, right? Why? The uh, lessee corporation and the unpaid subscribers are not liable solidarily to the obligation of the lessee to the lessor. What about the trust fund doctrine? Uh, is it not that the subscribers are not paid for the subscription and therefore the creditor, lessor, can run after them? Yes, but subject to any of those allegations that you mentioned. Condonation of a paid subscription, right? Dissolution and insolvency. None of which were alleged in the complaint for collection. Therefore, there's no basis to make an action for collection against unpaid subscribers. Next. But agro food processing versus vitamin, this is about docking the parent authority. So we, we know that um, uh, there, there are various ways by which the corporation may be bound by the action taken by its agent. 
cooperation of being a mere artificial being. It cannot act without agent. It can only act through agents. Okay. Either director, officer, or any other person acting on behalf of the corporation. So they can bind the corporation if their actions are authorized by the bylaws or authorized by the board, right? Or even not authorized by the bylaws or the board if the act is ratified by the corporation. Now, the bar is of ratification, either after the fact or before the fact, right? Now, the apparent authority, it's a form of ratification by which the corporation clothed the officer with the apparent authority and leads the third person to believe that authorized to transact on behalf of the corporation. So they vest legal title to the corporation. They hold out to the, to the whole world, rather, that they are authorized to transact for the corporation. Therefore, it doesn't matter that they have no board solution or they're not authorized by the bylaws. The fact that the corporation holds out the public, the authorized, means the corporation can, now, can no longer repudiate the action that they have taken on behalf of the corporation. Okay. That's the doctrine of foreign authority. In this case, um, there was an agreement between Vita Rich and um, AgroFood where it's a, it's a tall agreement. Uh, basically, he, um, he did dress no? the, um, the agro-food processing the mga chicken na Vita Rich. No? Right. So, siyempre may, buy, may, may bayad dyan, di ba? Eh, yung uh, tall agreement amended uh, so many times. No? So, ang tanong, is the amendment valid? Right. So, the, men, the amendments amendment made adverse to agro-food processing favorable to Vita Rich. So, sabi ng Supreme Court, um, uh, the amendment is, the amendments are valid because the document of authority. So, the one who represented agro-food processing had been caught with the power authority such that it led uh, Vita Rich to believe that he's authorized to do so on behalf of agro-food processing cooperation. Next. Okay, so this is an end bank decision. This is a case uh, penned by uh, Justice uh, Inting. He is not the chairperson for this year, but it can be asked because it it's uh, how do you call it? It's it's the first case on the extent of the application of doctrine of corporate opportunity. Okay. Now, what do you mean by this doctrine? It's a um, uh, a consequence of the fiduciary duty of a director or officer to the corporation, right? The director or officer should not take advantage of every opportunity or any opportunity to the detriment of the corporation. If that opportunity belongs to the corporation, let the corporation take it, right? So the um, director or officer who ceases or takes an opportunity belongs to the corporation, uh, well, should account for and remit profit from that transaction. And um, that obligation to account limit profit earned from the transaction taken from the corporation can only be excused if the, it is approved by stockholders representing two-thirds at least of the outstanding capital stock. And that obligation, as you all know, uh, persists even though the, uh, the director officer who violated his duty of loyalty uses funds for that venture transaction. Okay. Now, that's what the corporation code says, right? Then and now. Okay. Is a breach or violation of doctrine of corporate opportunity a criminal offense? Criminal offense. It's not a criminal offense. It's a violation of the corporation code, but that's penal in nature. As held in the case, I don't, I don't think it's here. Um, but I remember it now. Thanks be to God. The case of UCPB versus Antiporta versus UCPB. But the Supreme Court said violation of 31 and 34 of the code, not 33, uh, are not criminal in nature. Act of bad faith, but not criminal in nature. What happened in that case? Uh, Antiporda, then chairman of UCPB, authorized payment of bonuses despite the fact that the bank was losing money. Okay? That's in the context. Authorized payment of bonuses kahit nalulugi yung banko. Uh, so walang crime dyan, pero bad faith. No? Bad faith, but no crime uh, committed. Bad now, okay. Now, going back to this case, the end bank decision, the case of Topros, Total Office Products versus Chang. See, uh, Chang, invited by the owners, the T family owned Topros, they invited Chang to be the president. They made him a stockholder, and uh, T was able to make the corporation big. Uh, they distributed the Minolta papers, 
until uh, it expanded to various other uh, products and services. Ang ginawa ni uh, Chang, nag-put up ng tatlong kooperasyon. Yung mga, mga contract na dapat sa Topros, kinors niya. No? Kinors niya sa kanyang kooperasyon. Okay. So there's no doubt that he breached the this duty of loyalty to the to Topros, di ba? There's no doubt that he violated the doctrine of corporate opportunity. Okay. Ito mga argument niya. Let's see if it holds. First argument. Topros is insolvent. Does not have the means anyway to uh, pursue those transactions or carry out those transactions. Therefore, therefore there's no harm to the corporation because wala naman siyang capability to uh, pursue those transactions anyway, right? So no harm. Is that a defense? No, right? No. Because let me keep in mind, as you pointed out a while ago, the only way the the conflicted <coughs> director officer can be excused for taking an opportunity belongs to the corporation is if his action ratified by the stockholders, right? Represent two thirds at least of the standing company stock. It's obviously not one of them, right? But what is the relevance of the insolvency or lack of means by the corporation? The extent of damages by which Chang can be made liable. So there's no doubt he breaches duty of loyalty. There's no doubt he violated the document of COVID opportunity. But how much can be recovered by toppers against him? So the case was remanded to the RTC to determine exactly how much should be awarded against uh, uh, Chang and in favor of Topros. Now, the insolvency of the corporation will be relevant now, right? To determine the damages that can be awarded or adjudged against um, against uh, Chang. Siyempre, kung, kung wala talagang uh, capability to pursue it, must liliit ang amount of damages. But anyway, remanded to the court for for that purpose no? to determine the extent of damages that can be awarded. But no doubt, there's a, there's a breach of the fiduciary duty of loyalty and violation of the document of corporate opportunity. It's obviously not a ground uh, or not a defense mm, to avoid that obligation, but can be used to mitigate the extent of damages. Next. Okay, let's finish with cooperation law before we take a break, right? How many more slides on cooperation law? Maraya pa tayo. Anyway, 3.30. 3.30, we take a break. So, ultra-virus doctrine, um, DBP is the government institution. Can they, can the employees of DBP exact economic benefits to collective bargaining? Can the board of directors authorize the payment of bonuses to... Um, to uh, employees by mere memorandum or resolution. Ang nangyayari dito, nag-rally oh, yung mga officer, mga employees ng DBP. So to pacify them, binigyan ng uh, productivity bonus ng board. So sabi ng Supreme Court, wala kay, it's, it's ultra virus, right? Because the benefits of the employees of DBP are, are determined by legislation, not by collective bargaining. Next. Next. Okay, transfer of shares. All right, let's say a property owned by the corporation levied on execution. Okay. Can a stockholder of that corporation file a third party claim on, uh, on asserting ownership over the property? The answer is obviously no, right? Why? The property level of execution belongs to the corporation. Therefore, only the corporation can file a third party claim, right? Not the stockholder. The right of the stockholder is only in Kuwait that will ripen into full ownership only upon dissolution and liquidation of the corporation. Now, what if the stockholder who filed a third party claim owns 99% of the corporation? Can now file a third party claim? Still no. Because the fact he owns 99.9%, not enough reason to disregard separate legal existence. What about if the stockholder transferred his shares to a transferee? Can a transferee for a third party claim? So, sabi ng Supreme Court, if the stockholder as transfer cannot do so, with more reason, can a transferee not do so, right? Because transferee will only stand in the shoes of the transferor 
And assuming that transfer is valid uh, with respect to third persons, uh, he would just be in the position as a stockholder and uh, the right of the stockholders or inchoate that will happen to put ownership only upon the solution, liquidation of the corporation, is the corporation not stockholders should file a third-party claim. Now, in relation to transfer, sabi ng Supreme Court, the transfer between the stockholder and transfer is not binding to third person because it's not recorded in the books of the corporation. But even though, assu even though assuming it's recorded in the books of the corporation, why not recorded? Because photocopy lang yung sale agreement. Not record the books of the corporation. Therefore, not binding to the whole world and the corporation. But even though binding, at talaga mayroon transfer, as we said, the transfer only acquires the right of the transfer stockholder. And the right of that stockholder is only in Kuwait that will ripen into full ownership only upon liquidation and the solution, solution liquidation of the corporation. Next. Okay, we take our, take our break, 10 minute break. How many more slides do you have, Sarah? Anyway, okay, let's go. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. To Casa Discourse. So before we call on Dean Divina to continue with this lecture, we'd like to remind everyone that if you have questions, please comment them below and we will be collating them for the end of the lecture. That's all for our reminders, Dean. Okay, let's continue. All right, on derivative suit, Agro Realty versus Go, uh, this is yet to be asked in the bar. Uh, what is important about this case is that the Supreme Court um, basically said that a majority stockholder cannot file derivative suit. So this remedy is available only to minority stockholder. If you belong to the majority, your cause of action or remedy is to cause the board of directors to adopt the appropriate resolution to take legal action on behalf of the corporation. So board sanction litigations are still the norm. Okay? They still take the, uh, they're still the norm. So bar, uh, board sanction litigations take precedence over derivative suit. Derivative suit can only be filed by a minority stockholder on behalf of the corporation to enforce a corporate cause of action belonging to the corporation if the ones in control of the corporation are the ones guilty of the wrongdoing, right? As we all know. Now, what's the background of this case? So, uh, Dr. Angelita Go, belonging to the minority, a minority director, uh, constructed improvements on the property of the corporation. So, well, I think karaoke bar, no? On the property of the corporation. So, a uh, board director belongs to the majority filed the derivative suit on behalf of the corporation to compel the minority director to remove the structure or improvement from the property of the corporation. So, the Supreme Court, if you are the majority, your remedy is get a board solution, right? Uh, to authorize the filing of legal action to remove the improvements, but not to file the derivative suit because you are not a minority stockholder. Okay, next. Metrobank versus Salazar. This is recent, uh, March 9, 2022. But basically, in this case, the Supreme Court said whether it's intercorporate or non intercorporate, uh, as long as it's a derivative suit, it is filed with the, uh, it is considered a, um, a, uh, a case governed by the rules of intercorporate controversy. They were filed in the city or the principal, in the artist of the city. Where the principal office of the corporation is located. In other words, hindi importante yung party sa derivative suit ay merong intercorporate relationship. Hindi importante yung stockholders or corporation or stockholders among themselves. Pwedeng non-stockholder at corporation or non-stockholders uh, among themselves. It's not important. Basta pag derivative suit, 
it has to be filed in the RTC of the city where the principal office of the corporation is located. Okay, dissolution and liquidation. All right, um, what is the consequence of a mortgage on a property of the corporation executed after its dissolution? Is the mortgage valid? Or let's say the mortgage was done, is the redemption of the property, uh, mortgage property valid? And the Supreme Court said the mortgage is void, the redemption is also void. There's no need to redeem because mortgage is void in the first place. Why is why is the prop mortgage of the property a void? Because if the corporation is dissolved, there's only one thing that can be done with the corporation. The, the, the standard or barometer by which every action of the corporation is measured is, is that consistent with the notion or concept of liquidation. As you know, if the corporation is dissolved whether voluntarily or involuntarily, it must liquidate and wind up its corporate affairs, right? Meaning collect debts, gather receivables, collect all of the assets, convert them to cash, and then use the cash proceeds to pay off the creditors, and the residual assets are distributed to the stockholders of the corporation, starting with the holders of the PREF shares, if any, and then after the common shareholders, right? So therefore, that activity has to be compatible with liquidation. Now, mortgage, getting a loan, secured by a mortgage after the solution, is tantamount to continuation of business, which is repugnant to the idea of uh, liquidation. So therefore, the mortgage is void and the redemption is void. Would have been different, the Supreme Court said, if the mortgage was constituted before the solution, before the solution, in which case the redemption can be done even after the dissolution of the corporation. On what ground? There's no right or remedy available to the corporation or the stockholders shall be impaired on account of dissolution. A course of action, right, can be enforced against the against or by the corporation and stockholders by dissolution. But the assumption, as I said, that the mortgage was done before dissolution. So the remedy of redemption can be exercised even after dissolution. Next. Spouse Ong versus BPI Family Service Bank is about mer merger. So uh, BSA uh, Bank incurred a delay in the performance of its obligation to a to the mortgagor. Spouse Ong basically obtained a loan from, uh, well, it's basically an omnibus line from BSA secured by a mortgage on their uh, properties. The concept of omnibus line is that there a line is the term by which availments can be done by the clients of the bank. So if you had one year omnibus line and the omnibus line described the various facilities that can be availed of by the by the clients of the bank. So within that one year period, the term of the line, so the uh, mortgagers can as I said, avail of the loan, themselves of the loan and other facilities like TR or letter of credit as specified in the agreement. So the line is secured by a mortgage owned by Spanish Ong. So the other line is supposed to be, let's say, for 10 million pesos. Only 10. For 10. Ang ginawa ng BSA ba, only 1 million was released. 1 million. So sabi ng spouse, we need 10 as agreed upon, right? Well, well it is only 1 million. So after 1 million, the bank refused to release the, the, the excess or the rest of the amount committed. And then in fact, demanded payment from spouse song. So spouse song couldn't pay. And because they couldn't pay, BSA threatened to foreclose the mortgage. So I mean, but the agreement is you're supposed to give us 10. One is not enough for our requirements. Right. And then subsequently, BSA merged with BPI. BPI is surviving bank or the entity in that merger. Question. Is BPI liable for damages for the bad faith of BSA? There was bad faith in the bar BSA, right? Because committed to extend 10, but only release one, and yet threatened to foreclose the mortgage. And the Supreme Court said BPI liable for damages of liable for damages for the act committed by BSA. It inherited the bad faith of BSA. Because in the mergers, you know, the obligations of the uh, absorbed bank are assumed 
by the surviving corporation as if incurred directly by the surviving corporation, right? So all liabilities of the uh, of the absorbed corporation are assumed by the surviving as a direct incurred by the surviving corporation. Next question: Can BPI foreclose the mortgage? In the same way that uh, BSA Bank can foreclose the mortgage because of bad faith, then the BI, BPI have been stepped into the shoes of uh, BSA and have acquired uh, rights and obligations of BSA to the account of uh, Spaisong, likewise cannot foreclose the mortgage. Next. Next. Okay, foreign corporation. Uh, BIR versus interpublic group of companies. If a foreign corporation invests in shares of stock in a domestic corporation, subscribe to shares or buy shares of stock of a corporation, does that need a license to be able to invest in equity? As you know, mere passive investment in equity is not doing business, right? So therefore, the foreign corporation can be a stockholder of a domestic corporation without having to get a license to the business from the SEC. It has to contend with the rules or the laws allowing or restricting foreign share ownership in a corporation, right? That's the rule it has to contend with. But not uh, no obligation to obtain a license to do business before it can acquire shares or invest in the equity of a domestic corporation. Okay. Now, what if, let's say, the foreign corporation was not paid dividends? The foreign corporation not allowed to exercise the right to vote to elect directors of the corporation. Can the foreign corporation enforce its right as a stockholder without, despite the fact it had no license to the business? Of course, the answer is yes, right? So any rights or remedy arising from the investment in equity may be enforced or carried out by the corporation despite lack or despite not having the license to the business because it's not needed. Okay. Now, what about, let's say, the income arising, the dividend was subjected to tax. Not subject to tax, but subjected to tax by the uh, domestic corporation that declared dividends. Can the foreign corporation file a petition for refund without having obtain a license to the business and the Supreme Court said yes. So any any right or remedy as a consequence of investment in equity may be enforced without the need or despite the fact that the foreign corporation did so and invested without license to do business. Next. Okay, Quintin Lorente versus Star City. Um, okay, uh, what happened in this case? Okay, uh, Lorente was a casino player. Okay. So Star City is located in Australia, Sydney, Australia. So we'd like to play in Sydney, Australia. So uh, Lorente bought a draft from Equitable PCI Bank, now Banco de Oro. A draft that video issued payable to uh, Star City drawn against its correspondent bank in Sydney, Australia. So drawer, Nego is not part of the bar, right? But the important relation to our discussion here. So Banco de Oro is a drawer. It instructed its toy bank, responding bank in Sydney, let's say Bank of Sydney, or well, not the real bank in this case, to pay the order of so Lorente. Sorry, Lorente. Lorente, the pay the draft, went to uh, Sydney, Australia and played in the casino. So Lorente negotiated that draft in favor of uh, Star City to be able to... Uh, uh, get the program meant for high rollers. So as you know, if you're a high roller, you're able to stay or allowed to stay in a hotel, five-star accommodation, food and all. Okay. So Lorente negotiated that draft to be able to get the benefits that go with a specific program of Star City Casino. And fortunately, Lorente lost. So sabi niya, denaya siya no, ng, uh, ng casino. Instructed Banco de Oro, uh, Equitable Pisa Bank na Banco de Oro, not to pay. Star City. So Banco de Oro stopped payment. Instructed its corresponding bank not to pay uh, Star City. Star City now filed an action for collection and damages right, to enforce the obligation of Lorente and Banco de Oro in the Philippines. Okay. Lorente and BDO moved to dismiss the complaint on the ground that uh, Star City as a foreign corporation has no license to do business. Okay. 
is license to the business needed by Star City in filing that action. And the Supreme Court said it's not needed because Star City is uh, suing on a casual or isolated transaction. You need license to the business only if you're doing business, right? But Star City is not doing business in the Philippines. It is only a casual or isolated transaction. So the enforcement of the warranties of the drawer and endorser under negotiation law is only an isolated transaction that can be pursued by a foreign corporation despite not, not having the license to do business in the Philippines. Right? So what do you mean by casual or isolated transaction? It's a transaction that, is, that, is, um, that departs right, from the main purpose of the corporation. Something that's not related, that's something that's alien to the purpose of the corporation. Star City is a casino operator. What's the relation of uh, enforcement of warranties of the drawer endorser to uh, Star City uh, a casino operation, right? There's no relation. Uh, Supreme Court is a casual transaction. Thanks. Okay, this is a case penned again by Justice uh, Mon Hernando, Magna Reddy, Mix Conquer, Burst Anderson, uh, Bjorn Stard, King Jacobs. Anderson is a foreign corporation. Okay, organized under the laws of a foreign country at, not so sure now, at the USA. It entered into contract with Magna Ready Mix Con Corporation for some design and design project. So she understand is into uh, is a consultancy company that does design. Okay. And then when she Magna Ready uh, contracted with Anderson for Anderson to prepare a design for a Magna Ready's project. To cut the story short, Anderson was not paid. So Anderson filed an action for collection in the Philippines. Okay. Magda Reddy moved to dismiss the complaint on the ground that Anderson is a foreign corporation suing in the Philippines but no license to the business. Therefore, no legal capacity to sue. Okay, question is, does Anderson need a license to the business? The answer is yes. Even there is only one transaction? Right? I mean, remember, it's only a contract between Anderson and Magna Reddy, right? Although in the case, uh, it was established that um, Anderson contracted with another company, not Magna Reddy, also for consultancy project. So, uh, but assuming there's only one transaction between, uh, between Anderson and Magna Reddy, is one transaction enough to be considered as doing business? And the Supreme Court said, yes. Why? Either both substance test or continuity business test. Uh, why is it so? Why is Anderson considered doing business even though it's only one transaction? Because that transaction is indicative of the intention to attain the purpose of incorporation. So the very transaction that Anderson entered into with Magna Ready is a transaction that is related to its purpose as a consultancy firm. Right? You remember uh, the Foreign Investment Act enumerates the activities that are deemed to be doing business. The law then and now does not define what doing business is, but it's, it enumerates the various activities. The last one, remember, any act, any act or acts, right, that imply continuity of commercial dealings to attain the purpose of incorporation. So th that's the that's that's based on the law. It can only be one act as long as it's incident to or progressive to the prosecution of the purpose by which the foreign corporation was organized. Next question. So we have established that Anderson needed a license to the business to be able to sue, right? Because it's doing business in the Philippines even though it's only one transaction. But with the motion to dismiss prosper, it will not prosper. Despite the fact, right, that Anderson has no license to the business. Why? Estopel. Estopel. Magna Reddy dealt with Anderson, a foreign corporation, despite its knowledge it had no license to do business. It tripped the, the benefit from the contract with Anderson with Anderson. It got the design, right, uh, from uh, Anderson. So it was benefited by the work rendered by Anderson. And therefore, Magna is a stop or precluded from questioning the legal capacity of Anderson to sue in the Philippines. So this is classic, no? Pwede, pwede matanong to eh. Kasi ang unang conclusion ni Justice Juan Hernando, 
doing business, kahit only one act. Pero kahit walang license to business, the most you dismiss should prospect because of stopping. Next. Escape is one to transportation. Well, this is um, uh, basic anyway. Barge operator is considered a common carrier. Barge operator. We know this. A barge operator is a common carrier. Next. Next. KLM uh, Royal Dust versus uh, Dr. Chonko. This is a case uh, penned by, by Justice Hernando. So, ang nga dito, si uh, Dr. Chonko, mag, mag guest speaker, no? Uh, sa isang convention. Ang problema, yung kanyang suitcase that contained his clothing for the conference where he was a guest speaker, yung copy ng speech niya, sa kanyang source materials niya, hindi hindi, yung suitcase hindi dumating on time. So, nakarating siya, Pero wala yung suitcase. Okay. So, yung suitcase kasi, check niya, di ba? So, the question is, is KLM liable? Obviously, the answer is yes, right? What are the obligations of, of a common carrier? Uh, these obligations apply even to air carrier. So, for air carrier, like KLM Royal Dutch, the obligations are, well, number one, to make sure that the passenger arrives safely without being injured Right, obviously, or dying no? in, the, in the course of the carriage. Second, to transport the goods, I mean the luggage, by the passenger. And third, to observe and adhere to all the terms and conditions of the conduct of carriage. If any of these three is breached, then, or, or not fulfilled rather, the common care is presumed to be liable or negligent, therefore at fault. You all know that there's a presumption of uh, of uh, negligence or fault, not just for failure to uh, transport the passenger safely or deliver the goods, but non-observance of the terms and conditions of the contract of carriage. And that presumption can only be overcome by evidence of extraordinary uh, diligence. Next. Okay, just that's, that's, can you kindly backtrack? Um, Oh, not mentioned this case, but I think I, I should mention, given that uh, the Warsaw Convention uh, was was is, is included in your syllabus, I, I, I repeat, no, it's not found. There's a discussion of the Montreal Convention in this case of KLM Royal Dutch. That's the obligation of the air carrier. But just in case, merong uh, segue or merong uh, questions sa, sa Warsaw now Montreal Convention, uh, is this case governed by the by the Montreal Convention or under local laws? Remember the case involving uh, Chong also, uh, sorry, uh, Tanko, professor from UP, not able to deliver, remember, uh, his speech likewise, because yung kanyang speech nasa mans nasa kanyang manuscript, andun din sa kanyang suitcase, hindi dumating on time. Pareho pareho yung kaso, di ba? Um, ang sinabi doon, uh, he can file a case within four years. Tort. Not the two-year prescriptive period under the Warsaw Convention, now Montreal Convention. Why? Because there's a special species of injury, special kind of injury suffered by the passenger. But she was not able to uh, deliver the speech and deprive himself of the glory uh, and the prestige that goes with it. So that will take it out now from the application of coverage of the convention and local laws will apply. So two years is not the prescriptive period, but four years for tort under the civil code. Next. Okay, so uh, this pertains to, we know this already, but just to, just to be sure, is a, uh, um, a custom broker, a common carrier, so we all know that a custom broker is a common carrier to rate in this case. What does a custom broker do? A custom broker uh, signs import entry declaration form, pays import duties and customs, right, on behalf of the consignee, and uh, eventually transports the goods in favor of the consignee, right? So the main duties of the custom broker not to deliver the goods, not transport the goods to the consignee, but to pay import duties, uh, sign import entry declaration form. 
and uh, basically perform any and all acts required necessary to take out the shipment from the customs, right? And yet, it's considered a common carrier. Why? Because transportation is an integral part of its business. So the obligation does not end just because the shipment is taken out of the customs. It ends when the goods are delivered to the consignee, right? Okay, because of that, a custom broker considered a common carrier because transportation is part of his business. Okay. And therefore, if the goods were lost or destroyed, what's a presumption? Custom broker is at fault. And that presumption, again, cannot be overcome by evidence of extraordinary diligence. Next. Okay, uh, Castro versus uh, Kulipan. This was already asked last year. So, baka di natanong yan, di ba? But anyway, it's recent. Well, no longer recent, 2017. So, uh, we're not skipped. But anyway, sinasabi ni Josh Kagiwa dito, ang breach of contract, uh, an action for breach of contract carriage is against the operator, not against the driver, right? Driver not liable should be with the operator. With the contract carriage between the operator and the driver, right? Not sorry, passenger, not driver and passenger. Driver liable for tort or, or uh, criminally, but not for breach of contract of marriage. Next. So we want to direct all property. So Sunica versus uh, Natra Farm. Oh, this was already asked last year. Um, it's an end bank decision, as you know. So the only mode of acquiring ownership or trademark is registration, not, not uh, prior use, right? Um, so the Supreme Court abandoned previous rulings that ownership of trademark is acquired through use. So the certificate of trademark registration is uh, only a uh, prima facie presumption or evidence of ownership, right? So if it turns out that the registrant is not the first user, then the registration may be canceled, right? Okay. Uh, now the rule is the first one to register in good faith defeats the rights of the first one to use in good faith. So if both are in good faith, the first registrant and the first user, who has the right to the trademark? Under the old rulings, is the first user. Under the case of Sunica versus Not the Farm, is the first registrant, right? Now, what if the first registrant is in bad faith? In bad faith. Then the certificate of registration can be canceled. And when, when is he in bad faith? If he registered the trademark knowing that there was a prior user, right? The one that's a prior user. So his knowledge of prior use by another makes him in bad faith. And therefore, certificate can be uh, canceled accordingly. In Sunni Governors, Natra Farm, the Supreme Court uh, deferred to the findings of the IPO that the first registrant, uh, Natra Farm, was not aware that Sunika was the first one to use uh, Synapse as a trademark for medicine, okay? So not being aware, then uh, despite the fact that Natra, Sunica used it first, not being aware, the Natra Farm, the first one to register, owns the trademark. Now, in a subsequent case, I think the next slide, uh, involving Mr. Gulaman, ang ruling naman doon, the registrant, the registrant knew that there was a prior user for a trademark, Mr. Gulaman. And the IPO, adduce the evidence and establish, I mean, the prior knowledge of registration was established. So the IPO, in that case of Mr. Gulaman, has the trademark of the registrant. It was, it was done in bad faith. So you see, in the case of Sunika versus Natural Farm, the ruling is that uh, the first registrant owns the trademark, right? Despite the prior use of Sunika. Because Natural Farm not aware that Sunika used it first. Okay. In Mr. Gulaman, the, the IPO ruled that register knew about the prior use of the trademark Mr. Gulaman by another. The registration was done in bad faith. It was canceled. In both cases, the Supreme Court deferred to the findings of the IPO. There being no grave abuse of discretion on the part of the IPO. Next. Okay, non registrable mark. Can Sonic versus Uniline, uh, Uniline multi-resources Mm, what, what does certificate of, of uh, registration of a trademark give to the registrant? It titles him to use, right, the trademark for the goods specified certificate of registration or goods related thereto. 
So therefore, registrant cannot preclude others from adopting and registering the trademark for totally unrelated goods. The so-called the so document of unrelated goods that we know. Now, another, another important ruling in the case of Kensonic versus Uniline is this. Um, can a generic mark be registered? Okay. The answer is, a generic mark can be registered for the goods it is identified with. Right? Like, for example, uh, Sakura. Sakura is associated with flowers. Generic term for flowers, right? Therefore, can you appropriate and adopt and register Sakura as a trademark for flowers? You cannot. But can you adopt, use, and register trademark Sakura for uh, plasticware, for DVD players, for TV? Yes, right? Because it's not it's not identifiable with those products. Next. Next. Okay, this is a case that I mentioned earlier. Next. Next. Okay, uh, we all know, this is yet to be asked in the bar, the Supreme Court abandoned the holistic test, right? In determining uh, confusing similarity between two competing trademarks. There's only one test now, that is dominancy test. Under the then holistic test, the focus is not just on the dominant features of the two or three competing trademarks, but on the entirety of the trademark, including labels and designs. Under the dominancy test, the focus is just on the dominant feature of the competing trademark or registered trademark. If the dominant feature of the trademark is copied, reproduced, or imitated without the consent of registrant, there's infringement of trademark. So in other words, it's not required that the entire trademark be copied. It's enough that the dominant feature of the trademark is copied or or imitated or reproduced without the consent of the registrant, right? Okay. And what's the reason why the Supreme Court adopted or abandoned the holistic test? Adopted only the dominancy test. Because the holistic test has no basis now, no statutory basis. Uh, what has basis under the law is dominancy test. And section 155.1 of the Intellectual Property Code that defines infringement as a uh, colorable imitation of a registered trademark or dominant feature thereof. Okay. So, here's the definition. Okay. So, therefore, as I said, if you copy or imitate or reproduce without the consent of the registrant, not the entire trademark, but just the dominant feature, then there is infringement accordingly. Okay. All right. The kind of backtrack, uh, Sarah. Tamo, under dominancy, under dominancy test, ito bang Ehlers Lechon, saka Ehlers with a Z, Ehlers with an S, both for Lechon. Meron bang confusion similarity? Yes. Ang pinagkaibalan nila, S yung isa, Z yung isa. Okay, next. Next. Itong Levi's and Levi's Mark for the jeans. Before this case of Levi Strauss versus Sevilla and the abandonment of the holistic test, as you know, in previous cases, the Supreme Court ruled consistently that holistic test is the applicable test for genes. Uh, Lee versus Lee and stylistic Lee, the case of um, uh, Lee Garment versus uh, uh, Emerald Garment versus CA, right? The case of Levi Strauss versus LSJ genes. Uh, ang, uh, DS versus people. So in both cases, Supreme Court applied the holistic test. Not anymore. So given that there is no more holistic test, there is no dominancy test, Lives and Levi's are confusingly similar. Next. Okay, the another case spent by Justice uh, Hernando. Uh, what are the rights conferred by or conferred on the registrant of a trademark? Uh, number one, okay, the right to use, right? The trademark for the goods specified certificate or the goods related thereto. By by that phrase, goods related thereto, we mean normal expansion of business. Okay. And then second, the right to uh, exclude others from using that trademark for the goods that are specified certificate or goods related thereto. Third, to sue infringement, right? In case of in, in case of unauthorized use 
of the registered trademark. Now, Justice Hernando added the fourth. The right to adapt and register a domain name that contains registered trademark. Like Colleen. Colleen is a registered trademark for um, electronic products like voltage agree to adapt and transformer. So can Colleen Electronics right, register and adapt a trade a domain name for Colleen? The answer is yes. What's the reason why restriction for doing so? So it can sell the products in the internet or online. Okay. So as I've been just more now, it's included as one of the rights of the registrar. The right to adopt a domain name that contains its registered trademark or dominant feature thereof. Okay, next question. Can the registrar of the trademark okay, use that domain name to sell goods not covered by the certificate of registration? So I've been just more Nando, no. So the same limitation to registrant also applies for the adoption of a domain name. If the trademark registrant can use the trademark only for the goods mentioned certificate of registration and goods related thereto, if he adopts a domain name, then he can adopt and use a domain name only for the goods that are specified certificate of registration or the domain name or goods related thereto. So goods not related to the to the certificate of registration cannot be sold despite the adoption of a domain name. Next. Another case penned by Justice um, Mon Hernando for unfair competition, um, Somerville Garment versus Pausisco. Somerville Garment, of course, the distributor of uh, Chin Chun Su uh, facial cream. Chin Chun Su, pamaputi ng muka, no? Ng, um, very popular in Taiwan, brought to the Philippines. Pampa, before grew at Tatayon, ito yung, kasi mura lang tong Chin Chun Su. So, itong si spouse, si spouse's uh, ko, uh, nagbenta ng medical cream, no? contained in a pink oval shaped container na meron ding mark na Chin Chun Su. Right? Pero nakalagay sa kanyang container, sa container ni uh, spouse ko, no? manufactured by, let's say, spouse ko. So, not manufactured by Summerville. So, two products that exactly look the same. Para medical cream, para, para yung chin chun su, right? So, ngayon, dinimanda ni, uh, ni uh, Summerville, si Spouse Co. for unfair competition. you passing off your goods as those of uh, Summerville. Ang argument ni Spouse Co., eh, how can it be accused of unfair competition? Yung aming medical cream, yung container na nakalagay doon, not manufactured by you, but manufactured by us. Diba ang essence ng unfair competition? You pass off your goods as those of another. If you claim to the others, to the public, that this good is manufactured by somebody else when really in fact it's not. Eh sa amin, maliwanag. Sinasabi namin, hindi ka manufactured kami. So there can be no unfair competition. True or false? Wrong. So dahil yung Justice Mon Hernando, kahit nasa label mo, sinasabi mo, ikaw ang manufacture yan. If you give your goods the appearance of another, Okay, if you give your goods the appearance of another, another manufacturer, to deceive the public, there is unfair competition. So in this case, no, both are medical facial cream, both are contain a pink oval shaped container, both contain trademark chin chun su. So there was unfair competition. Next. Okay, let's move on to insurance. Okay, uh, Philam versus uh, Park Chateau and uh, Condominium Unit Corporation. Let, let's discuss the next cases all related to payment of premium on credit and installment basis. So let's take a look at the various uh, scenarios or uh, well, uh, possibilities. Okay, we all know under the cash and care rule, without premium payment, the insurance contract is not valid. It's not efficacious. The exceptions we all know uh, are exceptions. Remember, LIA S I S, right? LIA, L I E L I A S I S I C E, uh, L life, and then I industrial life insurance policy. Whenever the grace period applies. So, pag namatay ka yung the grace period, kaya ng premium liable insurer. A 
acknowledgement of receipt of premium payment. S, suretyship, right? If the bonding company delivers the bond to the obliging, okay, liable thereto without, even without premium payment. I, installment basis. C, credit extension. If the risk of loss occurred to the credit extension period and the last one is stop it. Okay. Let's take a look at the C and E, credit extension. Okay. Installment and credit extension. I and C rather. Okay. First case, Makati Tuscany versus uh, Court of Appeals. This was asked in the bar. Let's say the insurance policy allows for payment of installment. And the premium will have to be paid in four installment payments every quarter. After the first quarter, installment payment made before second payment could be made, the risk of loss occurs without the insured in default yet. So before the arrival of second period to pay, the risk of loss occurs against. Can the insured recover and if yes, how much? As we know, he can recover the full amount, right? Not just in proportion to the premium he paid. Why? Because the policy allows installment payment. So in payment. So then he can recover the full amount, having paid the first installment and not being in default yet of the second installment. Without prejudice or obligation to pay the remaining the remaining premium, of course. Okay. Now, what if there is no provision for installment payment? The partial payment, yeah. Okay. Tapos, tinanggap ng insurer before he could pay the entire amount. Risk of loss occurs. Is the insurer liable? Not liable, right? That's what is required. Not liable. Why? Because there is no full premium payment. The cash and care rule applies. No such thing as estoppel here. The fact that the insurer accepts the payment doesn't mean it's liable to pay. It has to return, right? But but liable, of course, for, for the full amount of the policy. Next. So, um, no premium payment, but uh, the policy allows for installment. Okay. Sorry. Uh, the policy allows for installment payment, but it says that if on the first installment, the insured does not pay, then the policy is avoided. Okay. The insured did not pay the first installment. The loss occurs. Is the insurer liable? The Supreme Court said in Philam versus Park Chateau, not liable. Because while the policy allows for installment payment, it's also clear that without the first installment payment, the policy is avoided. Okay? So therefore, insurer is not liable. Okay. Now, what if this time uh, no payment to premium is made, but the uh, insurer allowed the insured a credit extension of 90 days? from the issuance of the policy. And the loss occurs to the 90-day credit period. Is the insurer liable? Of course, we know liable, right? Because one of the exceptions, if the loss occurs with the credit extension. Okay. Next. Okay. Um, there is an agreement that the insurer, the insurer is given 90 days to pay the premium. Okay. He did not pay. All right. The loss did not occur. So the risk of loss did not occur. Can the insurer recover the premium? Okay. Can the insurer collect the premium? Or can the insurer say, you're never exposed to risk. Therefore, I'm not liable. So Sabin and Supreme Court, the next slide. In the same way that the insurer is liable if the loss occurs during the credit extension period, despite not paying the premium, then the insurer should be allowed to collect the premium for the same period. It was exposed to risk, right? Had, had the loss occurred, or occurred rather, the insurer would have paid. It's only fair, therefore, the insurer be allowed to recover or be allowed to collect the premium from the insurer. Next. 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 Rescission of insurance contract. This is 2018. Uh, this is a case penned by Justice Marvick Lonen. Uh, well, penned by Marvick Lonen, but not, not us. So, 
uh, the Supreme Court made a distinction between misrepresentation and concealment. We all know both concealment and misrepresentation are grounds, right, to rescind an insurance contract. If there is concealment or misrepresentation, the insurer is not liable. They should receive the contract, therefore not liable. Okay. What's the distinction? So, pag misrepresentation, there has to be fraudulent intent. Pag concealment, fraudulent intent is not required because it's inferred doubt in concealment. Okay? So, pag concealment, good faith, not a defense, right? The, the moment you concealed or did not disclose material information to the insurer, the insurer may receive the policy. Pero pag forced representation, misrepresentation, kailangan merong fraud daw. Otherwise, the insurer cannot receive. So, what happened? So, si Alvarez, uh, umutang sa Union Bank, secured by a mortgage on his property. So, required by Union Bank to obtain mortgage deficit insurance from Insular Life. So, Insular Life, the issue ng MRI, mortgage deficit insurance sa mga mortgagors ng, ng, um, ng Insular Life. So, the, uh, sorry, mortgagors ng, uh, ng uh, Union Bank. So, ibig sabihin ng mortgage deficit insurance, pag naman tayo mortgagor, right, the heirs can collect from uh, the insurance company and remit the proceeds of the insurance to the insurer to be able to pay the premium, right? Oh, sorry, to be able to pay the loan, I'm sorry. So the mortgage is discharged. So that's the whole idea of MRI, to protect the mortgage or at the same time the mortgagee. So ito si Alvarez nag-apply, you know, ng loan at kumuha ng MRI sa, sa insurer life. Namatay. Yung heirs ngayon ni Alvarez nag-claim sa insurance company para mabayaran yung mortgagee. Dinenay. Dinenay ng insurer life. Bakit? Kasi overage daw si Alvarez. So on the terms of the MRI, kailangan hindi ka daw more than 60 when you applied for the MRI. So there was one document, application, a uh, health form rather, sa may Alvarez indicating that he is overage. Okay. So is that enough to amount to misrepresentation. Sabi ni Justice Leonin, sa dinami-dami ng mga dokumento, bakit yun lang pitakita nyo? Bakit yun pitakita yung kanyang insurance policy? Yung kanyang mortgage contract? Ano yung pang dokumento? So kung talaga mayroong intention mag, 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 magsinungaling or uh, mandaya itong si Alvarez, eh dapat consistent sa lahat ng document na overage siya. So the fact there's only one document that like, negates fraud and intent on the part of Alvarez to conceal his age. So therefore, the decision should not prosper. The insurer should pay the heirs of Alvarez and the foreclosure of the mortgage considered void. Next. Okay, use, uh, UCB versus uh, Asgard corrugated box manufacturer. This is quite new, 2021. Okay, um, case that we handled, well, actually there are other cases we handled, but I didn't mention that. No? Um, ito nangyari. Si ABC at si XYC entered into a toll manufacturing agreement. If you say toll manufacturing, uh, let's say si XYC magmamanufacture ng corrugated boxes no, for um, ABC using the materials of ABC. So XYC owns the machines that will corrugate boxes from materials owned by ABC Corporation for subject to uh, payment of toll fees. Okay. So, um, kumuha ngayon sila ng insurance sa UCPB. Unfortunately, itong uh, si XYC, si Asgard sa kaso, no, nalugi. Hindi masyado kumita yung negosyo yung machine kailangan palitan na. No? So, ginawa ng ABC, yung mga machines, yung part ng machine ni XYC, Asgard, pinalitan niya ng bago. Pinalitan niya ng bago. So, it enhances the capability of uh, uh, XYC's uh, machine to manufacture and produce boxes no? and other materials. Okay. Unfortunately, the relationship turns out. 
So ABC pulled out the part of the machinery that is installed in uh, the machinery owned by XYZ Corporation. Pag pull out ngayon ng part na yun, declare ni XYZ loss, nag-claim sa UCBB. Sabi ni UCBB, teka muna, hindi ba yung kumuha ng part ng machinery na yung declaring loss eh, si ABC rin? Eh, ABC at XYZ pareho kayong co-insured. So the loss is caused by the insured himself. Therefore, under the law and the policy, you're not liable. So UCPB rejected the claim. Ground, the one who caused the loss, or the loss is caused by the willful act of one of the insured ABC corporation. Ang argument naman ni XYZ, sabi niya, but ABC does not have insurable interest over the machinery. So therefore, kahit siya pa yung kumuha ng part ng machinery, na, na important part ng machinery, na wala siya insurable interest, then yung kanyang inclusion as insured is void. Yeah. Okay. So we have already established that the loss was caused by ABC, a party to the to the insurance contract. So on that score alone, UCBB is not liable because of the willful act of the insured himself. What about the argument that ABC does not have insurable interest over the machinery, even though it's a co-insured, co and therefore the act of putting out the machinery should not bind XYZ Corporation? Uh, XYZ argued that ABC does not have insurable interest because it doesn't own the machinery. It's owned by XYZ Corporation. So let's tackle that question then. Is insurable interest premise on ownership of the property? Can you have insurable interest on the property even though you don't own it? The answer is yes, right? It has never been premise on ownership. Well, how does the law define insurable interest or how does jurisprudence define insurable interest? The kind of interest that the insured has on the subject matter of the insurance such that its preservation will bring about pecuniary gain and its distraction bringing about pecuniary loss, right? Yun ang definition. Are you connected with the subject matter of insurance? Pag nawala ito, merong loss. At pag na-preserve ito, merong gain. So in the, on that score, the Supreme Court said, ABC has insurable interest over the machinery. Dahil kung wala na machinery, then it cannot have the boxes that it needs, no? yung corrugated boxes na binamanufacture ng uh, XYZ Corporation. Okay. So there's insurable interest. It's a co-insured. And because the loss was caused by the co-insured, the insurer is not liable. Next. Next. The other insurance clause, another case by, by Justice Juan Hernando. Okay. Um, if there is no other insurance clause in the... what First, what is other insurance clause? Uh, if you have other insurance clause, then it's incumbent upon the insured to disclose to the insurer existing insurance on the property or other insurance uh, insurances that he may procure in the future. Non-communication or fail to communicate uh, the existence of an insurance on the property or get additional insurance violates the other insurance clause and allows the insurer to rescind the policy. Now, if there is no other insurance clause, as you know, the insured can get as many property insurances. That's what you call double insurance. One person insuring the same property for two or, from two or more insurers. Double insurance is allowed, right? As long as there is no over-recovery, of course, and there is no other insurance clause. But if you have other insurance clause, right? Uh, the the fail to communicate or make it known to the insurer of the existing insurance or others in the future violates the policy and allows the insurer to receive. Okay, next. Correct. Measure of liability. Measure of liability. Uh, another case penned by Justice Mon Hernando by the way. So, kung halimbawa, ang, ang total face value ng policy, as you know, the insurer is liable only based on the terms of the policy, right? It's not liable solidarily with a tort feasor or operator of a common carrier, but liable based only on the terms, based on the terms of the policy. So, if the face value is only 20,000, for example, then there's extent of his liability, right? Uh, no more, no less. The excess damage should be recovered from other insurers, if any, or has to be borne or have to be borne by the insured himself. Okay. Now, what if the policy, a TPL, uh, 
third party liability policy covering for loss or damage arising from negligent operation of the vehicle has sublimits. So about 20,000 in face value, no? Uh, 5,000 for injury to a uh, third person. 5,000 for damage to a uh, vehicle. Okay. 10,000 pag namatay. Yan. Eh, injury lang. How much can be claimed by the insured against the insurer? 20,000, the face value, or the sublimit of 5,000 pesos? So, only sublimit, right, of 5,000 pesos. Okay, right? Because that's the measure of indemnity as spelled out in the policy. Okay, what about kung debt? Nalagay 10,000, di ba? 10,000. So, 10,000 lang ang pwede maklaim for debt. Now, what if there are other damages? Like loss of burning capacity uh, and then uh, moral damages, for example. No? Then, uh, what is the extent of the ability of the insurer? Only up to the remaining amount. So the 10,000 for debt and the 10,000 excess should be covered by the policy. So no more, no less. The excess liability or damage should be shouldered by a third by other insurer or assumed by the insured himself. So to repeat then, so within... Uh, liable within the sublimit of the policy, right? For any other item other than the other than the injury or the uh, the loss provided in the policy, so anything in excess may be recovered from the insurer, but not to exceed the total value under the policy. Okay. Next, prescriptive period. Um, this is yet to be asked in the bar. So this is an end bank decision, the case of uh, Henson versus um, UCPB insurance. The Supreme Court, as you know, abandoned the ruling in vector shipping versus CA. Uh, in vector shipping, the Supreme Court said that the insurer has 10 years from payment to run after the tortfeasor or the wrongdoer or the one who caused violation of the contract. You all know that if the insurer pays the insured, what comes next? Subrogation. It acquires right, the rights and remedies of the insured. Uh, the insurer can proceed against the one who caused the loss or the injury suffered by uh, the insured. So whatever rights and remedies available to the insurer acquired, as you all know, by the uh, insurer. Okay. But within what period can the insurer run after the wrongdoer? In vector, 10 years from payment. Why 10 years from payment? Because Supreme Court then said the prescription or sorry, subrogation is a right granted by law. 2207 of the Civil Code. It's not contractual. It's a right granted by law. And the right granted by law under the Civil Code prescribes 10 years. Okay? So that is no longer controlling. Abandoned. Next step. Uh, next slide, sir. What is now the rule? So the rule is, so the insurer steps in the shoes of the insured and therefore inherits the cause of action and remaining period available to the insured, no more, no less. So it's not a fresh cause of action. The same cause of action inherited by the insurer. For example, um, see um, the one who caused the loss or damage to the property the tort piece or no? Let's say he committed the tort that caused loss and damage to the property June 1, uh, 2020. Okay, June 1, 2020. Okay. It being a tort, what is the prescriptive period to enforce the action? Four years, right? So from June 1, 2020 to June 1, 2024, the, the grief party may run after the wrongdoer. Right. Now, what if the, the injured party is insured. I mean, he insured the property damaged by the wrongdoer. And the insured files a claim with the insurer. And the insurer paid on December 1, 2020. Right? So the incident occurred, the tortoise action, June 1, 2020. Uh, claim was made by the insured, let's say July or August, and got paid December 1, 2020. Right? Within what period can the insurer enforce the right of subrogation? Four years from December 1 
2020, the time it paid, or four years from June 1, the same date that the cost of action accrued in favor of the insured. So the Supreme Court said in Hanson, it's from June 1. So therefore, the insured has remaining three years and six months only, not a fresh for a period to enforce the right of subrogation. Next, next. Well, we all know this, I mean, we know this, that uh, uh, subrogation, of course, is an equitable assignment to the insurer of all the remedies that insured may have against the party whose negligence or wrongful act caused the loss. Subrogation does not depend on the consent, right, of the wrongdoer, no consent of the insured. The moment the insurer pays the insured, there is an equitable assignment of all rights and remedies of the insured in favor of the insurer. Next. Okay, uh, action against the insurer. Okay, uh, this is very important. This is a case penned by, again, Justice Hernando. When may the insured run after the insurer? So let's say there is a loss uh, to the subject matter of the insurer and loss or damage to property, right? Uh, that the cost of action accrues. Or for life insurance, let's say death of the insured. Then the cost of action accrues in favor of the beneficiary. With what period can the insured or the beneficiary run after the insurer? Ten years, right? Ten years from accrual of cost of action because an insurance contract is a written, obviously written contract and a cost of action based on written, written contract prescribes in ten years. But there's an exception. What's the exception? It's an exception that's almost... Uh, almost um, is found almost in all insurance policies. What is that? The reduction of the period or the shortening of the period to file a case against the insurer. What is that? Usually one year from accrual of cost of action. So 10 years unless the policy reduces it but not shorter than one year from accrual of cost of action. So assuming there's a one-year period under the policy, when does the cost of action accrue? When does it accrue? Does it accrue from rejection of the claim at the first instance? Does it, does it accrue upon denial of request for consideration? The Supreme Court just said and reiterated that the cost of action accrued upon rejection on the first opportunity. Now, it goes without saying that if there's a rejection yet by the insurer, that the insurer has no cause of action, right? Now, once rejected, he has one year from rejection to file a claim or a suit against the insurer. Otherwise, insurer no longer liable. The cause of action is prescribed. Now, what if the insured requests for reconsideration? They reject the insured, no? The insurer. The request for consideration, you insurer. And it took months before the insurer acted the request for consideration, but eventually denied it. So when do you count the one-year period from rejection of the claim in the first opportunity or rejection on the request for consideration? Justice Hernando reiterated the rule. It's one year from rejection of the claim at the first instance. The request for reconsideration does not suspend or toll the running of the uh, one-year period to file a case against the insurer. Right? Now, this is, the other this is part of the case penned by Justice Hernando. What if the original complaint against the insurer uh, asks for damages in the principal amount of 300 million and the original complaint was filed within one year from rejection of the claim or accrual of cost of action and then the lawyer forgot to include interest? Diba? In case of delay in the processing of the claim or if... Um, uh, if stipulated, the insured may recover interest, di ba? Yung interest, dahil lang after filing the complaint. So the complaint was amended. The amended complaint included this time the interest. Okay. Question. Does the amended complaint retroact to the date of the filing of the original complaint? Or does that vacate the original complaint? 
resulting in a new complaint. Sabi ni Justice Bonner nando, if the amended complaint introduces a new cause of action, okay, because now this this time it has uh, prayer for interest, then the amended complaint vacates the original complaint. It does not supersede it. It does not retroact to the date of the filing of that original complaint. It vacates it. And because there is only one complaint standing, that amended complaint that was filed beyond the one-year prescriptive period, the insurer is not liable anymore. Now, what if uh, there is no new, new cause of action, just to amplify the original complaint? Then if it's only an amplification or supplemental complaint, then it retroacts to the date of the final complaint. But never if that amended complaint introduces or prays for a new cause of action or new relief or remedy. So that will not that will not retroact, but will vacate, as I said, the original uh, complaint. Okay, next. Okay, there's another one, I think. Okay, on partnership. I think this is the last one. On partnership. Uh, we all know that a joint venture is a form of partnership. It's akin to partnership. And the elements of um, a partnership are similar to joint venture. Agreement to contribute money, property ownership to a common fund, intention to divide the profits among the contracting parties, right? So if there's no agreement to contribute money, property ownership to a common fund, there is no partnership. Or if there's intention to divide the profits between and among the parties, there is no partnership. These two must concur, right? Now, joint venture have same elements. So if a joint venture has same elements as a partnership, what does it mean? That the parties to the joint venture must bear the losses. Right? Uh, share the profits equally unless otherwise stipulated, but like, likewise bear the losses. But if it's not a joint venture, but something else, then the parties there too are not liable to bear losses. What's the context? Take that to this case because this is the only case in partnership that I, I think may be asked in the bar. Um, ABC Corporation owns a property in uh, Bataan, ABC. So, uh, owned by the Badesses in this example. Anyway, this case. ABC owns a property in, in um, Bataan. The shareholders of ABC okay, sold their shares in favor of uh, La Colina Corporation. Okay. La Colina Corporation. So, making La Colina the owners now of ABC that owns the property in Bataan. So the agreement between the stockholders of ABC and La Colina is that La Colina will pay, in fact paid, let's say 20 million pesos. And the balance of a promissory note to be sourced from the sale of the lots and the uh, uh, income in, the, in a beach resort. So La Colina, having bought the land from ABC, from the stockholders of ABC, will develop that land into a beach resort and um, let, let's say golf course. And then the proceeds of the sale and income of the golf course, part of the uh, amount to be remitted to uh, the stockholders of ABC Corporation. Okay. So La Colina became the owner, as I said, of the land. Got money, obtained a loan from uh, the bank to finance the construction of the uh, Montemar Beach Resort, no? and uh, let, let's say the golf course later on. Okay, the loan was not paid, so prompting the bank to initiate foreclosure of the mortgage. So basically, losses were incurred by the Clean Corporation. Okay, potential questions. Is that scheme a partnership or a joint venture? Right. Is that a joint venture agreement? Just Hernandez said, it's not a joint venture. Why is it not a joint venture? Because the elements of joint venture are the same elements as a partnership. Agreement to contribute money, property, the to common fund, divide the profits between among themselves. There was never an agreement to contribute money, property, the to common fund. What happened was a sale, right? So the stockholders of ABC sold their shares in favor of... Uh, La Colina Development Corporation. And the, 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 the right of the stockholders of ABC to receive income from uh, 
the operations of the business or, or sale of the lot is just a mode of paying the balance of the purchase price. Okay, keep that in mind. It's just a mode of paying the balance of the purchase price. So it, it was it is not that a, a uh Sakuris of ABC uh couldn't build this property to be developed by La Colina, right? They sold the shares to the corporation, to La Colina Development Corporation. And the Supreme Court further said the fact that La Colina is liable to pay uh, the Sakuris of ABC despite the losses negates the idea of partnership or joint venture. Because if there is a joint venture, then there's no obligation, right, uh, to pay for losses. Kung losses yan, lahat tayo mag So, but the fact that there's obligation the part of uh, La Colina to pay the remaining amount of the purchase price indicates that it was never a joint venture or a partnership. So the essence of the partnership, the Supreme Court said, is the partners share the profits and losses of the business, which is not obtaining in this case. I think that's the last uh, slide. So thank you for listening and congratulations in advance. I wish you get a perfect grade in commercial law. Uh, I, th I think this year it is uh, uh, included in taxation, no? So for those of you who are uh, not so good in taxation, I hope your grade in commercial law will make up no, for that. But of course, I'm hoping that you're both good in commercial law and taxation. And I, I wish you all the best, not just for commercial law and taxation, but for the rest of the subjects, of course, in the bar examination. It is, um, today is August, um, it's about more than one month to go, right? So hang on there. I know you're very tired and you're exhausted. Uh, fatigue can come in. But you're near your goal, so don't don't give up. Don't give up. Um, hold on to your dreams, right? Uh, whatever is the motivation that that brought you this far, uh, remind yourself of the same motivation. You want to be a lawyer, uh, as requested by your dad or your mom. You want to help the dispensation of justice. You want to correct an injustice. You want a comfortable life. Whatever may be your reasons, no. Then think about those reasons again. To motivate you to push harder as you draw near the bar examinations. In my case, uh, since you have attended my lecture, now included in my prayers, I pray for those who listen to my lectures. I pray for my students, and I pray for those who listen to my lecture. Uh, I am very realistic. If I pray to God that let everybody pass the bar, He probably may not listen. But if I limit my prayer to only, I pray for those who are my students and those who attend my lecture. The prayer is limited. Hopefully, it works better, right? But anyway, so I wish you all the best. And um, I probably see some of you, if not hopefully all of you, during the prayer. Okay. God bless. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Because the beginning is now and ever shall be world out. Amen. There you go, Pat. I'm finished. Thank you so much, Dean Davina. Um, we have a few questions prepared. Uh, there were a few questions. Sure, sure. Here. Um, the first question is, can an OPC be a parent or holding corporation? Are there any limitations under the revised corporation code? Uh, can OPC be a parent or holding of the contemplation of the famers of the revised corporation code that an OPC cannot be a parent or holding corporation? Okay, thank you. Um, do we still have additional questions? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, I think, Dean, we don't have argument. Uh, we don't have questions anymore. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your time and for imparting your knowledge, not only to, to the, our viewers and... Ah, may humabot po. Can a suspended corporation sue? Suspended... I suppose you, by suspended cooperation, uh, uh, it receives sanctions from the SEC, but the answer is yes. Because it does not lose its legal personality. It is not dissolved, right? So only receives sanctions. It has all the rights and remedies as a cooperation. Okay, thank you, Podin. Um, or If there are more questions, please send them in now so we can discuss it with Dean Devina before we end our session. Nag-overtawad tayo pa. Dapat two hours lang, di ba? Pero okay lang. Okay lang. Okay lang. No problem. Okay. So there are no... 
there are no more questions po, I think um, we are good na po din. Thank you so much po ulit for your Correct. time. My pleasure, my pleasure. Okay, good luck. Uh, just a reminder for everyone, we still have sessions after this. We still have taxation law on August 7, political law on August 9, labor law on August 11, and legal ethics on August 14. Once again, thank you so much to our sponsors, our Rex Bookstore and Central Books. And thank you so much once again, Dean Devina, and everybody who watched, thank you for watching, and we wish you the best for your bar journey.